Well, this is pathetic. <laughs> a car? No, I'm sorry. A C A R. He's not here. Uh, Jamali? Barry? Barry's here. Bowman? Brown? Bushy, Boucher, Calzado, Here. Cantu, Here. Carrington, Here. Casey, Here. Chung, Clark, Cook, Curtis. <laughs> Golly. This is more fun than teaching, man. <laughs> Davila, Here. Estes, Forrester. You know, they told me they weren't going to be here. Golly, oh, wow, bummer. Why? Well, I think they've got some ocean thing that they had to go to for Randall. No kidding. I mean, they're half ocean people. Okay. I am Hardy. He'll big. Okay, well, I'll check him here then, too. He's got an excuse. Who? I won't count them all, all gone. Johnson. Here. Kuntz. Lahog. Leon. I think there's a lot of people just hiding in with the other ducks here. <laughs> hiding behind something. Mace. Here. Mitchell. Nabel. Perkins. Reeves. Here. There's no way. Reinhardt. Raymond. Rotz. Savoy. Saduki. I don't think Stein Hubble. Oh, there's Stein Hubble. I was going to say, I don't think Stein Hubble's in uh, Ocean. Okay, Stein Hubble's here. Stevens. Here. Tabor Taborga. Thompson. Here. Tidwell. Triska. Vickers. Wiley. Here. There's no way. There's no way. But now then, I don't know what to do. Zapita. I guess not. But I mean, you didn't pay me. If you don't pay me. <laughs> You don't get to you don't get to get a grade. Come see me if I'm just met, pronounced your name so badly that uh, as I that you didn't know who it was. Oh, is it Smith? Yeah, that's pretty hard. All right, here's what we've been doing. We've been taking columns that had an initial deflection, had a p delta. If it was just a p little delta, then the eight point eight six six took care of it to some extent, except now we're adding the fact that due to the delta, you have a P little delta, you'll have a little more moments that you'll have to add. It'll have to be amplified. Sometimes the amplification factors can get a little aggressive, and you should be able to uh, correct it downward somewhat. If you put lateral loads on it, same idea, <clears throat> except you already have a big delta, but you again get an amplification and you have a correction. We worked a problem similar to this one. Uh, I want you to go through all of the stuff here and make sure you understand it. It's, like I say, almost exactly the same as the other one. Stops there. And all of the tables and references to where you can go find where he got C sub B is equal to 1 and C sub B is equal to 1.32 and everything and all of the graphs used to quickly get the bending moment capacity so that you don't have to work it out using those equations. It's very similar. It's, it's, it's a column. It's still a column. It's actually loaded. Uh, it has a load from on the side of it. I'm not sure we did one of those before, but that's where you had to go. Here you go. Well, here's a C sub B. Here is the axial cap capacity of the column uh, without the lateral loads on it and uh, moments not yet being amplified. Uh, I was thinking maybe that's the one we did. Well, because here's another one. There's two of them. This one has a moment about both axes. I guess this was the different one. So it has a moment about both axes and it has a moment diagram looks like this. You'll need to know C sub B so you can find the bending strength 
of the laterally torsionally buckling column. And uh, here's your quarter points and here's your maximums and your half point and that kind of stuff. C sub B is just listed as a number. I think that's the only thing I need to explain when you take a look at this one and practice with it. I forget what he has for C sub B, but let's just say it's here. Maybe I can see it right quick. Uh, amplification reduction. C sub B, C sub B, C sub B. Here we go. Uh, for the beam design charts, here we go. C sub B is 1.67. Well, the book doesn't have a 1.67. It doesn't have anything. The, our book, the book you get to bring in with you on the on the quiz, uh, he doesn't have this case. He figures that's not going to happen real often, but it, it certainly could. And uh, Sagui has that listed in his tables in the book, so he just says 1.67. But you would have to do 12.5 uh, times M max. Divided by, I don't remember, 2.5 times M max plus 3 times M at the quarter plus 4 times M at the, three, the half plus 3 M at the 3 quarter. You'll have to work that one out, even on an exam. Now, you probably won't because you'll probably be smart enough to draw the little picture in uh, users in your LRFD and say it's 1.67, and that's perfectly legal. And here are the calculations. They follow exactly as before. The only difference is rather than having a load coming in from the side, they have nothing but moments on the ends. And your correction factors and things will be a function of M small over M large. If you remember that, we discussed it. So go through the numbers. It does get a little longer than a lot of them. I've tried to really tell you what we're doing so you don't sit there and say, what, in, what the devil is he even doing? Strong axis bending, going to get an amplification reduction. You'll have to amplify it. But if you're a, a positive thinking person, you probably say, well, let me go see how much I can reduce it before I even find out how much I have to amplify it. That's what he's doing here. Talks about the stiffness reduction. Talks about here is your amplification. It's not in ASC, AISC. Oh, that's C sub B. That's the one I was talking about. The C sub B is not in AISC listed. He tells you how to get it with the moments. You know how to get anything if you know the moment diagram. But it's not listed directly on his page for C sub B. Sugui does list it on page 10. It's one of the ones he worked out. That's the only reason he can just say, it's equal to 2.67. Then here's your supply. We'll be using the moment requests and the moment supplies. Then you've got weak axis bending. Same idea. Um, this is when I drop back and forth between the two books. This is your book if it's got real page numbers on it. If I got like a page 323 that came out of an old book and I needed, I wanted these pictures, but uh, here is uh, whether or not you use tau, is equal, tau sub B is equal to 1, stuff like that. Here are the graphs that you use. Here is the tail end of the solution. We're still trying to find amplification factors and corrections there, too. And see what this note is. Because the flange is non-compact, weak axis bending strength is limited by flange local buckling. Well, you don't care about that. None of that matters to you. Truth is, you just come right down here. The tables you use to get the numbers account for flange local buckling because they are production tables. So we were down to the supply about the y-axis. Then you needed to calculate the axial supply. And then once you had all of that, you could plug in the overall equation to see if it was a good column or not. So I'll leave it for you to follow through those numbers. It is going to take a, take a little time and some thought. But better that you do it now rather than on an exam. And if you have any questions, let me know. Come see me. I'll be glad to tell you where the numbers came from. All right, now connections are critical.
I want you to go ahead and read this information rather than me just read it to you. Most every structural failure I've been called out to go to court on has been connections. Hyatt Regency was a connection problem with 118 people killed. Very seldom do you see the main beams fail. You see them fail, but they usually fail and then they bend so badly and they pick up the reserve strength from the plastic moment and from the ultimate moment that uh, nobody dies. Everybody screams and runs out of the building, but it usually doesn't collapse on you. Connections have turned out to be a point of problem. Before the Hyatt Regency, there was no real firm handle on who was supposed to design them. In the past, the fabricator, the person who was going to build it, one of those people would design all the connections, and the engineer just knew that and didn't do that. And in the Hyatt, that's one of the things that happened. They had an engineer there, but they weren't real comfortable with a weird connection that was being used, and so they sent the thing back. Uh, they told the engineer, first off, we can't do it the way you want it. You told us to just put a big old 80-foot rod all the way to the bottom and then move the beam up and put the beam on here like this and run the nut all the way up underneath it. Then put the next beam up here and run the nut up underneath it. I said, is that what you mean? We'll bid it. But he says, no, no, no. Well, give me your idea. The guy wasn't thinking, and he put a rod like this. Then he put another rod next to it, and then the beam he put like this. Well, it turned out if you check this out, you find out that the load on the beam got doubled by this. In this case, the load went in the rod right through the nut. It only had one floor's worth of load on the nut, and this one would have only had one floor's worth of load on the nut. But this one, you put it together this way, and you end up with two floor loads on the nut. So it was doomed the minute they stuck it in the air. Nonetheless, at that time, the courts said, from now on, the engineer of record, the guy who's doing the engineering, putting his seal on it, you will be responsible for everything. We don't know if we missed something or not, but like connections have been slipping through, you've been telling us that this guy's responsible. Now, he may be in the lawsuit too, but he's not responsible. You are. So that was settled at that time. You can connect things with bolts or rivets. You bolt, uh, or bolts or rivets or wells. This is riveted. It could have just easily been bolted. This is the way they used to make them with rivets. Rivets were uh, hot little plugs of steel. Look like that. I'm sure you've probably seen them before. Uh, they'd heat them up in a big old furnace, and they'd throw them up in the air, and good luck. That's why the first, I guess, started wearing hard hats. And the guy would catch it with a bucket, and then he'd throw it up to the next floor, and then somebody would put it inside of the piece of steel to be connected. And a guy with a bucking bar, they'd call it, would kind of look like that. Uh, he would come, and he would mash a head on this end, and uh, the guy behind it would hold it so it didn't go anywhere, then it would cool off and it would shrink and it would hold the pieces together pretty tightly. Not near as tightly as we can do with bolts today, but it would work for 100 years. They don't do it anymore. You may still be asked to go check something's got rivets on it. Can we add another air conditioner on the roof? Then you need to know how they work. Welding, look at all the work it takes to put something like that together. First, you got to rivet or bolt the angles to the plate, the web plate. Then you got to bring in the uh, flange plates and you got to bolt them to the angles. That gets really messy. Uh, whereas if you just weld it, you just weld the plates together and you're through with it. It's all one piece. Here you'd probably weld this piece of steel <clears throat> to the column before you go out in the field. And then they will bring the girder and put it up against there. They'll put a bar that's kind of got a point in it through those holes so that they line up the holes properly and bolt the bolts on there. If you just bolt it and the top is still there, then uh, you don't have to check block shear of this piece of steel inside of the girder. Here you see the plate, 
And here you see the bolts from the side. If they do cope that out, then you'll have to check for block shear. Typical bolted connection, single shear means you cut the bolts once. Double shear means you cut the bolts twice. In effect, the bolts become twice as strong. But, of course, now you have three pieces of steel instead of two. Here it's welded instead. They may weld all the way around. They may weld just a piece of it. As you know, in some cases, your welding can get to be not sufficient, and you may be less than or equal to one. For instance, if you did this, welded it like that, then because these things are so far apart and so short, this piece of steel isn't really being used effectively, and you know the equations to count, account for that lack of steel when this tension load comes down the plate. This would be a simple connection. Everything's running right down the axis of the item. This would be uh, one where it's not a simple connection, where you also have bending. So rather than just loading the bolts right down their axis and each one taking an equal amount of load, this one has the uh, same things, equal amount going down each bolt, but they're also being torqued or twisted, which causes some bending stresses in the bolts. Same way here, uh, they've uh, bolted a T to a column, and although you will pick this load up and pretend it's right on top of these bolts, causing an equal load in each bolt, there's also a tendency to put this bolt in tension, and although this bolt doesn't really go into compression, a lot of times they just assume it does. The real compression is taken between the bottom of the T and the flange itself. Here's one where they are loading the bolts in tension. So we have several things you have to check. Bolted shear connection, failure modes. Most obvious failure mode is you just shear the bolt itself. These are made out of extremely high strength steel, 120, 150,000 PSI steel. That way we can make them small. If we can make them small, you don't have to drill as big a hole in the plate and bring the gross area down to a really poor net area. That has side effects. Number one is, is if you have a bolt inside of a steel plate, with this thing having a tensile or compressive stress of 120,000 PSI, when the bolt presses against the side of the steel plate, and I didn't mean those had negative side effects, they just have side effects, the failure will always occur in the plate in bearing. Because the plate's what, 50 KSI? maybe 80 KSI, and this sucker here is 150,000 PSI or 120,000 PSI, you know the failure will occur actually in the plate. Some people get a little careless when they'll say, okay, and the bearing stress in the bolt, well, that's true. The bearing stress in the bolt is the same as the bearing stress in the plate, but the plate is always the one that you'll be working with, always the one you'll be checking. Here you'll have a load on the plate. As always, you'll have to check the gross section area, net tension area, gross tension area. You'll have to check across the holes. Now then you're going to have to also start checking these bearing stresses. You really need to know where that bearing stress occurs. In this case here, the bearing stress is on this side of the bolt, and it goes through the bolt in shear, and then the bearing stress occurs on that side of the bolt. And then that load turns from compression in the plate, or it goes around the hole and comes out in tension, and it comes back to the load P. Here you have P and P over 2 in the two plates. Here the bolt gets cut once, drawing a free body of just the top half. You have the load on the top of the bolt, and you have the shear inside of the bolt. So that's really V 
And here you have uh, a bolt in double shear. So here we go. First, failure resulting, one mode, from excessive tension, shear, or bending in the parts being connected. Say no more, say no more. We already said it all. Gross area, effective tension, net area, block shear, anything that failed it before still has to be checked now. Now then, the new things to be checked would be shearing the bolt itself and the resulting bearing stresses caused by the bolt in the plate. Failure of the connected part because of bearing exerted by the fasteners on the plates. The hole's going to be slightly larger than the fastener. Otherwise, you'll never get it together. Contact between the fastener and the connected part will exist over approximately half the circumference of the fastener. That's right around in here. That's one diameter around the, around the bolt. Now you say, well, it doesn't look like that to me. It looks like a point contact. Yeah, but when you put the load on it that we're getting ready to put on it, you're going to find a big old gouge in this plate when you really stop at the limit. And that deformation is permitted to be a quarter inch. And by that time, this steel plate will have wrapped nicely around that bolt. Regardless of what you think the cross-sectional area is, uh, if you want to do the same thing your peers are doing, the diameter of the bolt is the pressure area uh, between those two plates, and you will take the bearing area as the diameter of the bolt, not the hole, multiplied times the thickness of the plate. That would be how much surface area is in contact. Now, even that isn't true because that steel, as you know, is horribly stressed, you say, all right, on up to F sub Y. Well, the truth is it's probably gone up past F sub Y. You say, well, okay, F sub U. And I say, well, the truth of the matter is probably past F sub U. So how can you get past F sub U? Well, it's like jello. You can't put a lot of pressure on jello unless you put it in a cylinder and uh, put a plug down in there that's sealed nicely. Then I say, how much force can you put on jello? You say, uh, just about any stress you want. It's not going anywhere. First thing's going to fail is the tube is going to fail in tension. You put enough load on it. Well, all of this jello, gel all of this steel is underneath a washer in the head of a bolt. And so is the area really the diameter of the bolt? No, not really. Is it really, uh, it can't squirt out of there until it gets out from underneath the head. And so probably what we're going to have to do is talk to the theory of elasticity people, and they say, you're nuts. And so then we're going to have to go talk to the experimentalists, and they say, go test every size bolt known to man or lady. Tell me uh, for different thicknesses, for different distances from the edge, this, that, and the other, the whole nine yards, how strong is that? Because I need to have a rational way to design these buildings. When they tell you how much stress you can put on a bolt in bearing, and they got a weird number like 1.2, 2.4, that's the reason why. But you still have to come up with the starting number and then work from there. The area in bearing is the diameter of the bolt times the thickness of the plate. Nominal strength is going to be equal to the diameter of the bolt times the thickness of the plate times F sub U. And they'll give you some factors to go with it. Uh, I was using the previous one just for all the pictures I got on there. Same page in your text. Now, other things can happen. When you drill the hole in here, if you drill the hole pretty close to the edge, it's possible to pull this little plug of steel out in front of the, in front of the bolt. Or if you keep it back here quite a ways, then you still may pull the little plug out. 
But if you put it back in here, I just don't think there's any way you're going to pull the little plug out. I think it's going to break across here. And then you say, well, it's not going to break across there because for this hole right here, this plate got to be this wide. So it's not going to break across there. And so I'm going to have to tell you what else could limit your strength. When this thing gouges about a quarter of an inch down into this plate, things have deformed badly enough that I insist quit. So you will have a limit based on the little shear plug here. L sub C, that's called L clear, times T in shear, and that'll be times 2 because there's one on both sides. Not to be exceeded by the number that is reached experimentally, and we can tell you what that is, uh, when you get about a quarter of an inch. Now, the Research Council on Structural Connections they're the people we depend on for bolts. They do all the bolt research. They do all the bolt numbers, and we take their numbers, and we stick them in our specs. By being in our specs, that means they're in your city code or your state code or your Navy code. The strength of this thing in shear, this little plug you're going to pull out, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Where do you think that point six came from? What is what's this right here all about? That's right. It's the shear ultimate. Why? Because the tension ultimate in steel is always about six tenths of that number. Always is the shear ultimate. And therefore, this number right here could also say F sub U V. But there any such thing as F sub UV. Nobody would know what you're talking about because it's always based on tension ultimate or tension yield. Six tenths times that number are the corresponding shear ultimates or shear yields. Six tenths is the shear fracture stress because it's a U of the connected part. L sub C is a clear distance from the edge of the hole. You say there's a little more steel here. They don't let you count it. It evidently didn't work out that well in test. Got to go from the edge to the edge of the plate. T is the thickness of the connected part. Here is the bolt people, bolt council, RSCS. Uh, here's their address, www.boltcouncil.org. And you want to see their code or their specs. Here are the specs for structural joints using high-strength bolts. The reason I went to see what it was is because Segui here says we're going to base all our stuff on 2009. That's getting kind of long of tooth. I was, I was thinking, okay, this is a, either my old book or your, old, your book hasn't been updated yet or something. 2009 is a pretty long time not to have something updated. It says right there you want to see the current specs. 2009, they say they're still good. Nobody's done anything since that time that was going to give you a whole bunch of extra strength at no cost or at any cost. Now, one of the limits will be shearing these little plugs out, and one of the limits will be gouging this little plate to a quarter of an inch. Equations for both. And you'll find out which one controls just by checking the equations. Here's one where the little plug sheared out. And uh, this one's where the uh, gouging of the steel to a quarter inch limited this load P. Here's one a little too close to the end. Uh, but they're not going to let you get that close to the end. But it is pretty much trying to shear that plug out. Here's somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. But it's okay if that's what he wants. If he says, I don't have any choice, well, you'll get a little strength out of this L clear and this L clear. They probably won't let you do that because once you put the nuts on there or the heads in the holes, you won't be able to get a wrench on it. So they're going to make you keep these center line distances some limiting distance apart. So here's our strength. Here is our little plug, A, B, C, D, as seen from the top. 
There's A, B, C, D. Here is the thickness. Right here is the thickness of the plate. There's the shearing surface area of the plug. There's your nominal strength. You're still going to have to, have to, have to hit that with a fee stick to bring it down to things that I can talk about. And therefore, 6 tenths F sub U times L clear times T. L clear times T. I believe your book shows a lowercase L. You know why they would change capital L to lowercase L in the specs and therefore force him to redo the book? I don't know. But I'm not about to do redo all these pictures. So that's little L sub C. L clear. There are two of them. And so the nominal strength would be half on this side. There's this side. So R sub nominals, 1.2 F sub U, L sub C, T. There's your equation number. There's the page where the specs tell you to find it. This needs to say, I think, L clears the distance from the edge of the hole well, now that's a little bit of a question. The edge of the hole or the edge of the hole? It's only the edge of the hole in the direction of the load. They will not let you put this too close. They say something like the edge of the hole in all directions. They mean this way and this way <clears throat> must not be too close. But when we're talking strength of these little plugs, we're talking the edge of the hole and the end edge of the plate, not the side edge. The true failure surface, when they really pull these little plugs out, they occur kind of at an angle, but we just assume straight line. Here is half of the resistance, half of the resistance, that's L clear. L clear will equal to L to the end minus the whole size over 2. Interestingly, the whole size is equal to the bolt size plus 1 16th because that's the size drill you used. That's it. And you say, I don't understand. Earlier, you told me that I messed up all the steel around the hole to the tune of another sixteenth of an inch and wouldn't even let me count it. Yes, that was true. And when you pull on the plate still, that steel has really been hurt, and I don't want you counting that extra sixteenth of an inch. But we're talking about bearing stresses and this little plug coming underneath here and those bearing stresses are underneath a nut and underneath the head of a bolt. And so I don't really care if you have messed up. I care that you drilled out, but I don't care if you messed up that extra sixteenth because that's part of the steel that's going to get messed up to the tune of a quarter inch anyway. And it's not going anywhere. So this is the size of the hole that you use in calculating these little... Uh, dimensions uh, across here in your bearing stresses. Total strength, he already had that on a previous page. Now then, he says, not to be exceeded by a limit of some magic constant times the same bearing, or times the bearing area. Bearing area uh, times F sub U. That C is a constant. He's, he's ashamed to even admit it. He's afraid you're going to ask him why it's so big. Well, I already told you why it's so big. Uh, it uses equation 7-1 for bearing strength, subject to an upper limit given by 7-2. If excessive deformation at a service load is a concern, that's at a service load, and it usually is, C is taken as 2.4. Wow. 2.4 times what you and I would have first off just said. It ought to just be, you know, some number. D times T, that's it. You crushed it. D times T is the area times F sub U, 2.4. Now, I don't mind this because we do it all the time. We say, go ahead and calculate something to make sure it's not any bigger than this. The truth is it's two completely independent things. 
And I bet you what these two are doing, I bet you that one of them's texting the other one. Because watching them both, one of them types, and then the other one types, and then the other one types. And I say, why don't you just talk? And you say, well, if I, we talk, you get mad at us. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Good enough. These are two cops. They're really different people. They don't even talk to each other. I mean, this should be less than that. That's true. But if you calculate this, then this must be less than that. So basically, you have two limit states. You check the two limit states. You take the lower of the two. Clear distance L sub C is in the direction parallel to the applied load from the edge of the bolt hole to the edge of the... I'm not sure that's an adjacent hole or to the edge of the material. That's, I, don't, I don't like those words. To the end edge of the plate. It is, it is material. We're always talking about the distance to the end of the plate. That's this way, not this way. Now, like I say, max seems like it ought to be just the area times the ultimate because that's what it fails at. Where do you get the 2.4? Again, here you got this washer. Here you got this liquefied steel, and it's trying to get out. And when it finally, once I guess it can kind of bend up underneath this plate, uh, it will start failing, stop picking up load. But until then, it just can't go anywhere. Probably long before that would happen anyway, you've reached a quarter inch of crush in the plate, and that's the limit. That is set, so set with that 2.4. The old days, the whole size for tension was diameter of the bolt plus 16th fit plus a 16th damage. Now then, the H that you're going to use for bearing stresses is going to be diameter of the bolt plus only the fit. The thing I used this whole page for was figures. has the same equations as I just showed you. Uh, here's one. This is the H we were just talking about, diameter of the bolt plus a sixteenth only. Uh, dimension of this you need for the calculation, how strong is the little plug that's being pulled out. L sub C would be L to the end. There's L to the end defined from the center of the bolt to the end of the plate minus half the whole di diameter. This one, on the other hand, is L sub C. Here is the dimensions I would give you. I would tell you that this is four inches from there to there. You need to calculate this. So you would take four inches. You would subtract half of the drill size, which is the hole size, minus half of the drill size, which is the hole size, not including damage. And that would give you the L sub C. That's the clear length. Had another one back here, same thing. This one would have three inches with a whole size on both sides subtracted. This one would be six inches, whatever I said, minus two whole, di uh, two whole radiuses or one whole diameter. And then this one right here is going to be L to the end minus only a half of a whole diameter. That would be the length of this line. Uh, same thing. This is a little more noted. This came from the shear load that you can permit on the plug of the plate. This came from the crushing load on the plate. Between the bolt and the plate. More pictures in case you don't understand. You say, I understand, I understand. Here's the little plug that's being pulled out, A, B, A, B, D, E. There's what you see looking at it from the top, A, B, D, E. Underneath it's the prime numbers. There's your little failure plane, two of them. Bolts. You can buy them with them threaded to the head. They don't really get threaded quite that far. There's, there's a shank down in here, little little space. They're threaded as high as they can. And when you install it, the threads are included in the shear plane. 
They say N stands for not excluded. I don't, I don't like that. It's a negative negative that I'm not sure what it means. I see if they are here we go. This is a good one. The threads have been purposefully excluded from the plane of shear. And as such, there's more area on the bolt. So I understand X meaning excluded from the plane of shear. And if it's not that, then it's in because it's not that. It's this. I don't know. I just like included and excluded. Your choice how you remember it. Why the difference? Because this has pi d squared over 4, and this does not have pi d squared over 4. See how much smaller the root area is across there? I'm sorry? No. See, looking at the bottom of this bolt right here, here's what it looks like right there. And here, here you see the threads down in here, down in the bottom. Now then, I understand that you see the peak of the threads here, but the, the, the root of the threads are down in here. And if you're going to shear it across the roots, then you've got to get a pi d squared over 4 where the diameter is equal to this diameter minus the distance from the peak to the root on two sides. So you have much less area in the root area than you do in the original bolt. As a matter of fact, it's right at, this number is right at 8 tenths of the bolt before you tinkered with it with a dad gum thing putting threads on there. No, the threads are ex see the See the two plates? You see how they're being pulled? You see how the plane of shear is right here? The, did you see any threads in there? They were excluded. When this plate shears on this plate and it shears right across here, did you see any threads? What are you shaking your head? No. <laughs> right in the middle? Well, all right. If this, if this bolt right here, before it starts getting threaded, if this diameter is one inch, what's the area? One inch time thickness? No, it's pi d squared over four. It's, these are round bolts. That's the trouble. You're used to seeing square bolts. <laughs> the round bolt is a pi d squared over four. Now then, if you cut some of that metal out of there such that this goes as far as here and this one goes as far as here, and this new dimension is minus 0.06 minus 0.06. The cross-sectional area is pi new smaller diameter squared over 4. No, this is the shear plane. This, okay, here's the shear plane. And the threads didn't get up there yet. Maybe I want to take a few threads out. Oh, no, 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 That's a, those are bearing stresses. Now I'm talking to you about shearing the bolt. Now, these, the, this bolt is still bearing against that full thing over there, diameter of the bolt times the thickness of the plate. And down in here, even though there are threads in there, that's okay. We consider that these things here will fill up those threads, and they do, it does, as you really mash that steel into the bolt. I'm sorry, I guess I didn't mention what I'm looking for. I'm talking about the thread area being cut or not cut. All right, and more pictures with bearing stresses and definitions of L sub C. For load and resistance factor design, uh, since it is a breaking situation, we will be using a resistance factor of 0.75. So when all is said and done, uh, he had doesn't have it, might have it on the previous page, I didn't notice. Nah, well, he'll get to it. Those nominal loads that we were calculating a minute ago will be reduced to 0.75 of that value. And he talks and he talks and he gives you the equation I told you. Uh, L to the center line, that's right is equal to L is sub E minus H. That's an N. This is L to the end minus uh, 
h over 2, that was your clear distance from this point, from this point, from, shut up, you're confusing me, from that point to that point, because the load's going that way. We already talked about that. We already talked about this. We already talked about that. We talked about that. I don't throw anything away, man. I... Uh, no, I tried to retire last year. I went over there and I applied, and they said, you can't retire. I said, why? They said, you've never worked. <laughs> and that's, I could, what can I say? <laughs> All right, so if you have something that looks like this, it's an inch and a half that way and two inches this way, don't be using the two and a half for your L clear. Uh, this dimension here. Okay. Now, this L sub E is the one, this is the distance from the center line to the edge. You'll notice he also lists this is L sub E. Uh, that's, that's true, it's an L to the edge, but it has nothing to do with bearing stresses or anything else. They will make you keep this bolt. They don't want you putting the bolts like this. That's just not permitted, so they'll make you stand out L sub E. But L sub E to the end and L sub E to the side don't have to be the same number at all, just because they're both called L sub E. To maintain clearance so you can get a wrench on there, they'll require that the center, center spacing of the fasteners in any direction, no less than two and two-thirds the diameter of the bolt, preferably no less than three. You can live with this, but you probably don't want to walk out on the job site when you're doing it because uh, you may get a wrench in your face. Uh, D is the fastener diameter. Minimum edge distance in any direction is given in a table. It's a function of the bolt size. That table, here's the, what is the page it's on. And then I've got one on 385B. And let's just take a quick look. Here is the spec. Minimum spacing in any direction, he tells you. Minimum edge distance, he tells you, and he refers you to the table. Here's a typical table for a three-quarter inch bolt. They don't want you anywhere near closer than one inch from the center of the bolt hole to the edge of any, to any edge of the plate, in the end or on the sides. All right, we'll start there next time. Yes, sir. Did I not call Gamble? Well, you know, maybe I just was, that's when I talked and said, you know, I just realized why all these people weren't here. Quit, quit looking at that. That's not yours. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Age of the bolts of that bolt. Sure. The one I just showed. The one that I asked the question about. Sorry. I can tell you what I got. Oh, uh, where you had the one that was threaded and not threaded. Oh, yeah, no, I don't know where that is. Yeah. No, oh, wait, it's way down towards the end. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Why are you... Um, See, this... Let's, let's come over here where other people... Contact with the bolt. Well, I don't know about in con the surface area in contact with the bolt is indeed unchanged no matter where the threads are. Okay. I'm talking about the sheer strength of the bolt itself. Okay. So when this plate moves to the left and this plate moves to the right, this bolt gets cut, just like with a pair of scissors. Yeah. And it gets cut across its long axis. I thought these alternated where you had the short side alternated. That's that's true. That, yeah, I don't have well. Yeah, I don't so have it drawn real accurately. No, 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 no. Because let me let me change it because I can I can do that. 
uh, you would be you would be correct that on this side this would be a high spot. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just I just drew it. Yeah, that's just kind of what I was. All right. No, no. Now, now watch here. here. Now watch here. Now here we go. Still gonna have to change. Now here is your cutting area. Okay. Do you agree? Number one, you lost this. I don't. The, the area's got to be smaller because. Right now, what you're cutting through is you're cutting through a low spot. You didn't you didn't add anything on this side. No. You just didn't reduce the diameter at that point. Right. All right. Now they have two things. One of them is called the root diameter or the root area, and uh, that actually goes from there to there. It's okay. listed. It's listed in all the tables. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. There might be. A an angular shear. Right. And then there's another one that includes one thread's area. Now, let me see if I, without messing things up too bad, if I can find that. I think I can. But we always consider the shear point right on that line. No, not really. Not really. You get to include the fact, your fact, in, in fact, you get to include the fact that you are not only getting the minimum thing, but you're getting a little more due to you have to cut. You have, when you cut through the whole thing, you've got to cut a thread someplace. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here it is in the table. Number one, for a one-inch bolt, you have so many threads per inch. The net tension area is uh, 0.606. The minimum root area is 0.587. And the gross area with no threads is 0.785. So you're going to be using not the one I told you, inside thread to inside thread, mm -hmm. but inside thread plus thread plus a thread. Okay. You'll be using this area here. So this smaller uh, area would be if you were to draw. That is correct. Root to root. Okay. okay. But it it would really depend. Say you give it how you draw this bolt. Absolutely. On that. Line Absolutely. However, I would not draw that. I would tell you that I'm using A325N bolts. Well, that means I'm automatically the, th the threads are included. Or I'd say we're using A325X bolts. That would mean we're excluding. That means that you would use either the shank area or the threaded area. Uh, 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 there. Uh, 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 uh. See this plate going to the right? See this plate going to the right? I'm thinking double shear that we can. Well, okay, it could be. Well, there's no double shear here now. See, there's a single shear plane. Oh, it would depend if this was. Well, well, this is a bolt. This is how it's got a nut on the bottom side here. Okay. There's no other plate. If there was other plate, I would show it. Now, if you say, well, I was thinking maybe of this situation here, that is indeed double shear. And if I'm going to spend the money to exclude the threads, then I would show you shank, 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 thread, 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 shank, 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 thread, thread, thread. And I would say that's an N connection where the threads are, excuse me, that's an X connection where the threads are excluded from here. If you said, look, you know, keeping up with a bolt like that and trying to figure out where the threads are, fooey, just thread the whole thing all the way to the top, then that is an N Included, and you must use the small area. Times two. Double shear to worry about. Time, times two. Yeah, the engineers got to all the time about what we're doing. We got double shear. We got the bolt here that's going to shear there or there. No, 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 no. It's not going to shear here or here. It's going to shear here and not fail. If you say it sheared here, mm -hmm. then I'm telling you it didn't fall apart. This piece was still connected to that. Where it's going to fail is when this thing gets pulled and it shears in double shear two times. Mm -hmm. Then it fails. No de uh, de well, there are no defects in these bolts. We don't permit such a thing. And if there is a defect in that bolt, you remember that's probably why you got that little fee on there, that resistance factor. Yeah. If there's a defect in that bolt, there's, nine, there's six other bolts in that connection. I bet you that one's a little stronger. And if you say, well, I think there's a chance they're all six defective, 
That's why we put the fee on there to take care of the chance that every now and then it might happen. Yeah, Very rare. Very rare. Okay. Okay. I get it. All right. Thank Good. You. Sure thing.